Hello, everyone. Welcome to another installation of Craft Chat. We're so excited here to have Susie Gonch with us. This time she'll be speaking about radical jewelry makeover and her work. So um, we're going to get started right away. I'm just going to give you a, a, a quick bio of Susie Gonch is a first generation American artist of Hungarian heritage. She's a sculptor, jeweler, and educator living in Richmond, Virginia, where she is associate professor and metal area head for the Department of Craft Material Studies in the School of the Arts at Virginia Commonwealth University. She received her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And part of her practice is directing the Radical Jewelry Makeover, an international jewelry mining and recycling project that continues to travel across the country and abroad. Um, issues of waste and cultural habits of consumption are imbued throughout her work. Um, she's had recent solo exhibitions like Have a Nice Day at the Court Gallery in Richmond, Virginia, and How Soon Is Now. Um, her work has been included nationally and internationally in museum exhibitions, including the Smithsonian, National Museum for Women in the Arts, um, the MFA Boston, the Design Museum, London, the National Gallery of Victoria, Melbourne, Australia, um, and, and many more places. We are so pleased to have her here right now. Her work is on exhibition in, um, in the Radical Jewelry Makeover, the Artist Project exhibition, and will be on view at Fuller Craft Museum until November 22nd. So I just like everyone to give her a warm welcome. We can't hear you, but um, we'd like to give her a warm welcome to our craft chat. So Susie, yes, oh, <laughs> we see some of the applause um, symbols out there. Thank you, <laughs> thank you. So Susie, how are you today? Oh, God, this is so wonderful. Thank you for hosting me and having me do this. I really appreciate it. It's so awesome to see all of your faces and names on the screen. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm sending out virtual hugs to all of my friends and hellos to all of you that I haven't met yet. So thank you for coming. This is so cool. Thanks, Titi. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. We're, we're, we're very excited to have you. And oh, and folks, by the way, I know you're going to have a lot of questions. So if you could put your questions in the chat box, we will select them at during our Q&A section. But right now, we're just going to have a conversation. And, you know, Susie, if you could just let us know, give us a kind of overview of the Radical Jewelry Makeover um, mission and process. What mm -hmm. is that about? Yeah, uh, good question. So the project is a community collaboration. So what we do, we get hosted by institutions and a gallery generally. And what we do initially is we target collaborators, jewelers generally, um, who want to join this collaboration. And then what we do is we make a call to action donation drive where we blast out through social media, radio, newspaper, in that institution's regional community, and we ask them to mine their jewelry boxes for their unwanted jewelry. And the reason we do that is that, you know, we're trying to raise awareness about where our materials come from in the jewelry manufacturing industry. I mean, we're targeting jewelry because that's what we do is we make jewelry and, and we want to create change within our field of interest. And so um, at this time in the jewelry world, in the jewelry industry, there is very little transparency as to where our materials are coming from. So meaning from mine, to from mine to consumer all along that supply chain, it's pretty rare that you would understand and know what land was uh, mined, what were the harms done to that land, what were the miners paid, what lands were desecrated, who was harmed, who was not, the whole story of it. We don't know that. And so um, the project was designed specifically so that we could set an example of a circular economy that starts from the jeweler, from the consumer's mind jewelry box, right? So when we go into the community, we say, hey, we know that you have an old class ring. 
we have, you have mismatched earrings. You've got Mardi Gras beads. You have all kinds of stuff that you don't need anymore. Give it to us. And we're going to create transparency starting at your jewelry box. We're going to put it in the hands of jewelers. We're going to remake it and we're going to put it back out into the world. And so that's the basic premise of the project. And the mission is to not only educate jewelers in that are collaborating with us, mm -hmm. but also to create this, to, to educate donors, but then also to create community around this shared concern. I see. That's excellent. That's excellent. And how do you feel that community has blossomed? Like, how have you, how have you experienced that? Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, you know, one of the other missions of the project is really to deeply um, value collaboration. And so when we are working with a community of jewelers, we really rely on that community and ask for shared governance, shared decision making. Mm -hmm. um, we say, okay, what are the expertises that are brought to the table? You know graphic design? Okay, help us with publicity. Oh, you know how to write a press release? Okay, you write the press release. So we're, we're distributing all of the aspects of the project along that collaboration when we go into a community. And it becomes this really important um, variable in the project. Like we're trusting in the community that the collaboration will work because we're a shared group of smart people that can uh -huh. do this thing, right? Yeah. So it's not really a, a top-down project. It's rather a, you invite us and then we all do this together type of thing. And it has really created I mean, we call it the RJM community. I mean, our RJM community is uh, comprised of over a thousand people now that are part of the family that we have worked with. And we, um, it has really shaped the way that the project has kind of uh, rippled out how it has continued mm -hmm. on and why it has continued on actually. Mm -hmm. Now, could you tell us about the artist project specifically? Um, yeah, so one of the um, side projects that Radical Jewelry Makeover started uh, was back in for two, 2014. Um, I invited alumni, so I'm putting this in air quotes, alumni of the project uh, to come back and dive more deeply into the design strategies that we promote and the thinking that we're challenging artists to uh, apply when making work. Mm -hmm. And I invited them to come back and dive deeper into a broader body of work that uh, the project would then represent and, and travel at, to exhibitions around the country. And so this is the work up on the screen that you can see right now. And so what, what I did was I partnered with my students, I pulled them into the project mm -hmm. and we, uh, I had them research who these artists were. And then we went through donations that we had and they selected the donations to send to these artists. Mm -hmm. And then the artists were sent a series of questions and the questions were really to um, kind of have a transparent dialogue about what are the challenges that we face as makers when we're trying to have a wise studio practice. So what does it mean to have a wise studio practice? What are the parameters that you put on your making and your concepts when you're putting the environment and social justice above everything else as your concern, right? Like what, what does that look like? like in design. And so these artists were sent a series of questions, they documented their process, and then we have it all on the website okay. that we have online. So at radicaljewelrymakeover.org, if you go to the artist project. And so this work, I mean, I just think like this work of Adam Whitney's, for instance, Adam got a, a bunch of gold and he refined it himself. It's all transparently outlined in his, on his page. And, um, he made these amazing pieces. And our, you know, our mission is really to get this work out into the world because we feel like it's vital, beautiful, and it competes with conventional jewelry. And it also then has this beautiful story. I mean, one of the amazing things is, is that jewelry, one of jewelry superpowers, mm -hmm. lately I'm into jewelry, jewelry superpower, but one of jewelry superpowers is that 
it tells a story. It conveys a message. It Mm -hmm. signifies something about the wearer and it projects out into the world, right? So we believe that this jewelry has this potential, or at least I hope so, to compete in the world and get on people's bodies. Ah, it's not the superpower of jewelry. Um, are there other superpowers too that we that we should know about or that you think about? Or you know, lately I don't know why there's so many jewelers on this call. So I bet all of you are like, okay, what's another superpower of jewelry? But I I know that there are. You know, like I love that without speaking, somebody wearing jewelry tells us something instantly when we see them, right? Like I, I'm the jewelry I'm wearing, what do you already know about me? Like in a traditional sense, you know that I'm partnered to somebody, mm-hmm. right? You don't know the story of that, but I'm, I'm wearing a ring on, on my wedding ring finger, right? Yes. Um, so in, in this unspoken language, there is so much potent energy there that it's transmitting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, when, when artists are working on these um, different reconfigurations, re, um, recreations, are they thinking about function? Are they thinking about the aesthetics? What are some of the challenges in, that you know, are going through their minds in terms of the process? Sure, that's a great question. I think that the jewelers that we've worked with, that I've had the pleasure of working with and the honor of working with, have all approached the project differently. Mm-hmm. Like this, for instance, up on the screen is Adam Whitney's transformation of a teapot into mm-hmm. a pair of earrings, a ring, a brooch, and a necklace. And he wasn't necessarily thinking about the conventional wearability of those things. He was challenging himself to do a design problem mm-hmm. that had a conceptual reuse outcome to it. The brooch is certainly wearable. The earrings, I've tried them on. Well, I should confess, I have tried them on. They're a bit heavy, so I can't wear them. But to me, they ignite my imagination in the way that he has figured out how to take this plated teapot Mm -hmm. that was in our unwanted reuse pile Mm -hmm. and give it a new life, breathe new life into it and, and, um, allow it to go on to another another lifetime, right? And and so to us, that's one way to solve the problem. In the slideshow too, there's some um, brooches by Erica Bello, and she oh, ask and you shall receive, um, <laughs> is right here. And these are made out of crushed Mardi Gras beads. So we get a crazy amount of Mardi Gras beads, and um, they have no value, and they will sit in the landfill. Uh, for uh, thousands, hundreds, thousands of years. And uh, in my opinion, they should never be made, but that, that's just my opinion. And, and so what a design challenge. Erica crushed the Mardi Gras beads to make these amazing brooches. So, you know, the jewelers are, are thinking of storytelling. They're thinking of me- reuse in an innovative way. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of ingenuity to figure out how to take something that had a previous life. Mm-hmm. It had a strong aesthetic. Mm-hmm. Like a lot of the work that we get is costume jewelry and costume jewelry, we cannot melt it down and erase its prior aesthetic, its prior history. With silver and gold, we can infinitely melt that down and reuse it over and over and over again without degradation. Mm -hmm. But like 90% of what we get is costume like these Mardi Gras beads. And so the artists need time, they need material, they need uh, to collaborate and talk to each other and exchange ideas and to come up with ways to reinvigorate this work. And so it, it feels like for us, you know, as the director of the project, one of the things that I really want to do is get this material in people's hands so that they can innovate and can invent new ways to work with it. Yeah. And then RJM gets to 
broadcast that work out into the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so there's this trade. It feels like this vital trade between uh, the people I collaborate with. You know, like I'm going to put this material in your hand. I'm going to teach you some things and then you'll give back some innovative work. Nice. It was a bit of a ramble, but did that answer that question? It, that completely answered that question okay. and, and also made me think about um, the process of teaching to an instruction and how that plays into your role as um, the choreographer <laughs> of mm -hmm. this yeah. process. Um, yeah, that's a good question. You know, in truth, we're not teaching anything new with Radical Jewelry Makeover. I mean, we've been, so jewelers have been recycling gold and silver and uh, for millennia. Like we, it's something that we do. Um, we've been reusing materials and uh, um, reconstituting, recollaging them. You know, this is not new. What we are doing is actually doing it through this lens of environmental and social justice. So we're shifting the gaze on the horizon, but we're not teaching necessarily new techniques. What we are challenging people to do though, is to take traditional jewelry making techniques and apply them to all of the materials and jewelry that they make in the project. So we try to suggest not to use glue or not to use, you know, like what are the materials that you might use if you're a very traditional jeweler, like all of the cold connections that you know, all of the ways of putting things together that don't involve the easy ways out like glue. Aha, I see, I see. But that said, I also will say that we don't say no to glue. Like we present people with ideas and we present people with materials and um, reasons. And then we say, you find your right answer. It's not about, you know, me in imposing what I think is right. Like mm -hmm. all I can do is say that this is what I think is happening in the environment. This is what I think we can do about it. This is our participation. And now you make decisions based on your environmental values and your studio values. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fascinating. And have you found that, um, have you found techniques or artists in particular who've come up with ideas that were surprising to you, you know, or, or you know, processes that were surprising or out of the ordinary? Absolutely. I mean, every, I mean, all of the slides in the artist project that are being uh, shown right now actually have innovation in them that I have been excited about. And I have been um, surprised by, you know, like little simple things like Taylor here is sewing and knotting these pieces together. We, and it, and the look it, taking beads that uh, where, you know, we get thousands and thousands of beads that we don't know what to do with actually. And, and revitalizing them in a way I've never seen a pair of earrings quite like that, you know? And so there are big surprises every time with projects. So, yeah. Wonderful. Now I know we're, we're, we've seen a number of works here from the artists and the artist project, but you have a whole other side um, of, for installations and larger works that I wanted to talk with you about. How does how do your larger pieces relate to some of the jewelry work and RGM work that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, RGM has really influenced the way that I work. Um, when I first started the project back in 2007, I, I was actually generating my own multiples to make larger pieces. And those pieces were made up of enameled parts or cast resin parts or forged parts. And I made, I would make hundreds of them. And I, one of my students actually, Gabriel Craig challenged me on what I was doing. He's like, how can you actually do this project and not apply the values of the project into your own studio practice. And I was like, Ooh, shame, shame, you know, like absolutely shamed. And cause I knew he was right, but there's something about um, having this blank slate or this virgin material that we get to work with as artists. Like I can, I, I get a clean slate every project I start. 
And I, but I stopped that. And so like right up, up on the screen, those are two brooches made from um, pill bottles and lids from my daily pill regimen uh, that I take every day. And so I collect every bottle that I use uh, for my daily health regimen mm -hmm. and um, fabricate with them. Or I collect from my community. So I use Instagram and social media a lot to collect material, which is not unlike RJM. You know, in RJM, we collect, we, we can't do the project unless the community donates jewelry to the project, right? Mm -hmm. And every time, surprisingly, we get about 100 pounds of unwanted jewelry in every community. Mm -hmm. um, and in my in my own practice, I collect single use trash bags. I collect like here, there's uh, white garbage and bits and bobs that people collected for me for a few months. Um, I collect different lids and bottles. I collect coffee lids. If anyone wants to collect used coffee lids for me, I'm collecting right now and they're really hard to come by because nobody is, uh, socializing or communing. So if you want to collect for me, but I, so I collect everything. And, and as a result, it's actually, I think deepened my, my own individual studio practice, because there's a sense of relying on my community. There's a sense yeah. of um, me connecting my studio practice to the world outside my studio. So I have an independent practice. I work alone, but I actually don't work alone. I work with the hundreds of people that send me stuff. Yeah. And this is such an important part of the process for me. Um, and then turning something unwanted into something that's wanted. Um, with some of the work too, I like last year I was collecting used old faux pearl beads and also single use trash bags or shopping bags, which I'm still collecting. Um, and people that sent me large quantities, I turned around and made them a brooch from the material and sent it back. And I was thinking about this exchange as kind of a brooch of gratitude, but also a brooch of shame in this way, like not, not saying bad, bad you person for having all of this stuff, but that just that, you know, we're all complicit in the decisions that we make that affect the environment. You know, and, and again, jewelry as a superpower that says, yeah, I do participate in this and it's something I should do better, but I'm also celebrating the complexity of that, mm -hmm. that, you know, relationship that we have, you know, like our relationship to plastics is incredibly um, problematic mm -hmm. and also fruitful in this crazy way. Like what mm -hmm. have we figured out to replace plastics that is equal to it in terms of consumption of energy to produce it and how it affects the landfill other than looking bad. You know, like, so there's this kind of complex relationship that I'm, I hopefully am um, leaving a little bit ambiguously open in my work, but mm -hmm. also poking at it pretty intently mm -hmm. and poking at myself. Mm not just people that are gifting me these things. Yeah. Was that a long ramble? Was that okay? That was that was a that was an extremely long ramble that was that was excellent. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Sorry. That really went off on that one. No, I, I the whole time I'm thinking of the wanted turned into the the unwanted turned into the wanted and how we are complicit in these things and um, I think often especially nowadays a, a lot of us have been thinking about you know being authentic, being deliberate, and what is complicit, you know, and to get a brooch back, com you know, composed of something that I did not want, and now I want it, it would make me more conscious of, um, of how I'm using and how I'm consuming. So it's, it's mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, do you, I wonder how much feedback you get from people about the pieces that you make and how they may be changed or I don't know is or is that important to you or is that besides the point or yeah 
Yeah, that's a good question. Like, well, maybe to make sure that I understand the question, like, do you, are you asking if people are changed, their opinions have been changed by the work that I make? Is that what you're asking or? No, more of the, more of the um, emotional or verbal feedback that you might get or letters or anything like that, that yeah. gives you a sense of how it's being consumed again. Yeah, that's, uh, Interesting. Even just yesterday, I had a an, um, a conversation with somebody that it, it might be commissioning one of those coffee lid tapestries, and mm -hmm. was interesting. It's an interesting conversation to have, you know, with somebody that I'm making this piece out of used coffee lids. It's it depicts oceanic currents. It's about complicit action. It's about environment, but yet it's beautiful. Yeah. And it's something that somebody wants to possess or own in their home. And that is a complicated relationship of pride and shame. It, you know, like, I think there's this, like, it, there's a bit of a tension there, uh, at least in the conversation I had yesterday, as the example I'm using, that um, was interesting to me that it, how can something be both a celebration and a commentary, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I guess I've had that feedback uh, back and forth uh, from others as well, that there is that tension a little bit. And then I'm happy because I want that. I don't think that the way that we live our lives is easy, one-sided, and um, something that we can uh, name with a single sentence. You know, like we live complicated, contradictory existences where on the one hand, we do something really well. And on the other hand, we shamefully do another thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's almost the definition of humanity, in my opinion. Like we are really good and really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that, that's another ramble, but I, and maybe that didn't answer the question so well, but. That, that did answer the question. And um, it makes me feel like, um, or, or, in essence, that discomfort is, the, is one of the end products. And mm -hmm. um, maybe is another superpower, if, if I may, <laughs> of, the, of your creations. So um, very interesting. So I'm wondering about if, if we can get into the nitty gritty of the process for RJM. And I know, you know, there's sorting and there's all kinds of um, their pieces, their steps to this process. And I'm wondering if we can go a little bit into detail about it. Sure. Um, yeah. So I gave the overall how we do it. We go from jewelry box to jeweler to back out into the world, but then there's a lot of steps in between. Um, we, once we've done our call to action donation drive, we do a huge sorting of material. So that's the images that you'll see now up on the screen mm -hmm. um, where we work with participants and, and the participants can be beginner level that have hardly touched material or uh, seasoned professionals. Like in the image in the lower middle on the left, the woman in the light blue uh, shirt, mm -hmm. that is Robin Krenitsky, who's, you know, world famous, amazing jeweler. She came to help us sort the material. And so we have to and, and she's standing next to a beginner student. Jaden Moore is in there. He, you know, had prior jewelry knowledge. Lucy Derrickson is in there. So we mix everybody up so that it's a, it's a collaboration. We're all learning together. Okay. We read the hallmarks on the jewelry. We, everyone has their loop out and we're analyzing every piece of jewelry because we have to get it into the right pile. Meaning if something is gold, we want it in the gold pile. If something <laughs> is fake gold, it has to get in the fake gold pile because the way we're going to work with it is really different. And so um, the sorting is kind of the most fun that may not have sounded fun how I just described it, but it is so fun. Uh, yeah. Here you can see like it, it's where um, the students who we work with get a chance to see 
trends, styles, techniques, and and it's it almost sort of clearly distinguishes wanted from unwanted. So if you're looking at all of this material as unwanted, you start to wonder why how did it get here? Why is it here? Uh-huh. Yep. And then um and then you also find treasures that you might want to work with. You know, like so it it helps students actually get to see like how their what they might collect after the sorting to work with. So that it, it's a place for them, them to start seeing uh, inspiration. And so here you can see a student on the left, uh, Michael Del Bernard modeling all of the rings he found. And then Yevgenia Kaganovich is holding up some, I think those are penguins actually, it's pretty good. <laughs> and then, you know, and all of that. So another part of the collaboration is that everyone in the sorting teams, we come up with the category. So like in Wisconsin, one of the images that you'll see coming up is Green Bay Packer jewelry. In, in RJM Wisconsin, of course there was Green Bay Packer jewelry. Everyone loves the Packers and who doesn't have a Green Bay Packer pin? Okay. You know, and so, and then there was a turtles category for that one as mm-hmm. well. You know, you also find these unique things like the piece on the right is some uh, gold set tooth on a coin purse and so like it it um everything gets touched and everything gets sorted you know and it's also where we credit the donor so that's the part that I haven't talked about yet that because we're creating a circular economy all of the donors get credited for the reuse value of the material that they donated and that that reuse value is an important part is because a lot of people don't distinguish between uh, the types of jewelry that live together in their jewelry boxes. And that means high end jewelry or, you know, high value jewelry and costume jewelry. They often mix those together. They wear them at the same time. They don't distinguish, but in our economy, reuse is the highest value. And so we credit donors with a higher value coupon based on that material that they, they donated. So we weigh it, we give them the day's rate. For costume jewelry, we give a lower percentage. And so with that coupon, donors come to the exhibition at the end and they can claim a piece. Oh, I see. Oh, excellent. excellent. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say, you mentioned treasure. It seems like a treasure hunt in many ways, oh, definitely. Um, totally a treasure hunt. It's, um, it's kind of crazy. If you're any, if you have any um, magpie in you, it's very difficult to not, <laughs> not like have your own stash, like, okay, I'm going to make something out of all of these things. Um, and so it becomes this really exciting thing. The students that we work with uh, learn a lot because there's a lot of information that jewelry is embedded with that tells us what the material is, who made it. And so it's a chance for us to really teach that. Identifying gems, semi-precious like materials, it must be some difficult and discerning work. So it's interesting. Yeah. And often what we do ask in, in communities, we ask if there's an appraiser that would donate their time. Cause you know, truthfully, I'm not a gem appraiser. I'm not, you know, I can look at it and give an assessment and, but I can't give an accurate assessment on it. And so when we get an appraiser in, it's really awesome. Cause they know things about stone and gems and materials that we don't know. Okay. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So can we stop for a moment and talk a little bit more about the whole collaborative process and shared work? You know, um, what is that like? And uh, are, could you give us a, a, a more detailed description of that, that piece? Yeah, sure. So I think, and jewelers on this, um, on this Zoom will all have opinions and things to say about this, but oftentimes we work alone in our studios and, uh, or at least I consider myself a pretty solitary creature. And, you know, the whole um, idea of shared work sessions is one of the things that we really value because we, it brings spontaneous collaboration into the 
into the mix where a beginner student might be partnered with a professional because the beginner can't finish the work and a professional says, hey, let's do this together. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's this way that things come together. It, it's also very high energy. So one of the things that we try to do, like uh, for instance, um, when we did RJM in the Bay Area, there, some of the institutions were able to open up their studios to allow professionals who weren't registered for classes to come in and do shared work sessions with the people that were registered to do classes so that yeah. there is this community building aspect. And um, what it does is it allows for group critiques. It allows for you know yeah. film screenings where we can show documentaries and videos about uh, it, the environment and the jewelry supply chain that open up transparent conversations about why we do the project. It has this uh, way of bringing in uh, the time necessary to do the, the things that we want to do, meaning teach the things we want to teach. We also stop. So these are some images that was kind of perfect timing. The images up on the screen when we're doing sorting And when we're making decisions about the material, we do them as a group. So let's say for instance, and you know, we have um, everybody that donates to the project is invited to tell a story about why they donated the work that, or the material they donated. And um, we often use those stories as inspiration and we make decisions based on on things that are donated where a student will say, I'll take that story and that material, I'll make something for that person. And then the group votes and we send that thing back to the person. Like it goes into the exhibition, but we just wanna send it back and gift it to the person whose story was so moving to us. You know, so we, as a collaboration, we can make those decisions in real time during shared work sessions. And it feels so great to have that opportunity to be part of a collective, to be part of a group. Um, Yeah. Wow. Uh, You made me so curious about the stories. Gosh. Um, Are there some that you could share with us? I'm, I'm sure that you've run across so many. Yeah, that we have. So so we keep everything. I mean, that's the other thing I should tell you, uh, maybe before I do the stories is that we document everything. So every donation is documented with the donor's name. Here's an image. So here's like the hundred pounds of stuff that we get. And then the sorted stuff, you can see it in that image. Um, But we document everything. And the reason we do that is that we want to have an accurate record of, okay, Susie Gonch donated these are the materials she donated so that if we ever need to go back into that pile, we can, Mm -hmm. the donation form is kept. And that way there's a visual record that matches with the donation form. And so that we have all of the records of every RJM that we've done. And um, so, yes, there are hundreds of stories that we have. And, and so for instance, like one of the first, and I, I, there's an image in one of the, uh, PowerPoints that I shared. Uh, okay, let's see if we can pull that one up with the stories. I wonder if you have any moments where you share those stories with the public too. Yeah, that's such a great question. You know, we we only recently started doing that. So for um, RJM that took place in Baltimore at the Baltimore Jewelry Center, one of the things that they really wanted to focus on was the stories. Mm -hmm. And because the stories, why we keep jewelry, why we wear it, there's, it's, it, it, it is, um, there's a lot of intimacy there and there's a lot of meaning. We pass jewelry on to our kids. We pass it on to our loved ones. So how the story is imbued in that jewelry is so important. So Baltimore Jewelry Center wanted to really focus on that. And so that has made us move on and in meaningful ways to actually pull the story forward. So Mm -hmm. with RJM Wisconsin, we hired an actor to read the stories at the kickoff symposium that we plan at the beginning of every project. Ooh, so hold the slide here. We'll, I'll, I'll share the, the next slide, hold the next slide. Mm -hmm. Um, 
the, and the people were in the audience were laughing. They were crying. I mean, the actor did such an incredible job and it, it reminds us of, of the superpower of jewelry, Mm -hmm. right? Like why we have it around. And, and so from my perspective as director of the project, it feels like this perfect moment to poke at that and say, so why would you want something imbued with so much meaning to have potentially caused harm to the environment mm -hmm. or another human being? Like it's this way to perfectly bring that together because yeah. when our heartstrings are pulled, we actually pay attention in a different way, right? Yeah. Yes. You know, so the stories have become this really important part. So we're hoping to continue that tradition of, of reading stories at the kickoff to the public because it's a public uh, symposium that we host. So, okay. well, well, and so here I have this story. I printed out the story. Um, this is from, this is a ring by Matt Jackson. Matt is giving the angelic face in the upper <laughs> left-hand corner here. Yeah. Um, he has gone on to be a professional jeweler. At the time that he made this ring, he was a beginner student in participating in RJM. And we got this donation. And here, I'll, I'll read it to you. It's really short, but we were so impacted by this. Okay, this was written by a man um, and he writes, I've recently divorced my wife. The day she told me about her affair, I took off my wedding band and tossed it into the quote, junk drawer in my kitchen. It has been there for over a year. I considered some grand symbolic gesture of its disposal, such as tossing, tossing it into the ocean, but your project seems more appropriate. And so we were like, oh, you know, I mean, <laughs> you know, we were really impacted by his anger, by his hurt hurt. And yeah. so Matt Jackson raised his hand and said, I want to do something. And so he made a tornado ring as a oh, metaphor yeah. to honor the donor's story. And so, you know, we made this ring and we sent it right back in the mail to him, you know? And so to us that felt, and that was such a, that was a democratic decision that all of the participants decided on. I see. I was not expecting that story. Oh my gosh. But it's real like that. It's almost like that ring was tainted for that man, right? Like it, it needed, he needed to, it to be away from him. And, and I feel like, you know, I have a pair of, I have two pairs of earrings from my grandfather. My gra I'm a fourth generation jeweler mm -hmm. and my grandfather, um, I've never met him. He died in, in Mauthausen at the liberation of the camps after uh, at the end of the Holocaust. And I have these two pairs of earrings. And if my house was on fire, I would grab those earrings, mm -hmm. right? Cause they're this, I am connected to my grandfather. That's a priceless co connection. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so when, when there is a betrayal in a relationship you can understand how that wedding ring became this symbol of everything um everything hurtful. opposite right yeah yeah you know um and so that's an example of 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 some of the ways that we use the stories wow wow yeah. can you tell yeah. us another story yeah so this one um carlton so we got this donation of these earrings and i'm not going to tell you this story because it's actually really painful as well i have some optimistic stories after <laughs> this one. okay so, but this one also this is another story of absolute betrayal love betrayal um you know a relationship with an affair at lies and this woman wrote, everyone in the room, the whole group was together when we were sorting uh, that day. And I read the story, I stopped the class, I stopped the group and I read the story and we were crying. Everyone in the room was crying at this betrayal. This, I mean, this woman so honestly wrote her story about these earrings and we didn't know what to do with them. We were like, what are we gonna do? to take the pain away from the story, you know? And so Carlton, uh, the student on the left was a senior at the time and he volunteered. He said, let me take it. I'm gonna do something with them. And he made this 
ring where there is a gold crystal coming out of this silver crystalline structure and we sent it back to the donor and I've actually been in contact with her she can't wear it because she has arthritic hands and I've been begging her I was like please send it back to me I'll size it for you so you can wear it but she was really touched and so happy to have it and she thinks of it really fondly now and that it's such a nice thing to actually have heard from somebody um that we completed the circle with you know wow wow oh it just reminds me of how brave artists need to be to actually you know do their work you know oh my gosh it sounds like uh, such a courageous process also to attempt these transformations um, right like who knows she could have been insulted or not happy or you know like we take I think that's the other thing about the project is that we believe in the risk mm -hmm. of utilizing the material and trying to do something with it you mm -hmm. know like I I believe in um, handing the material putting it in the hands of jewelers that they're going to make great decisions with it you know it's about trust a little bit as well I think collaboration is based on trust. I mean, it has to be, right? Mm hmm mm hmm So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and then this one, I'll just read this one because it's really, it's really sweet. So this was a necklace or necklace made by Jim Meyer. And you can see those orange beads in the lower left-hand corner, right? Yep. And so this was given by um, a person who wrote I'm always excited to see jewelry take on a new life. This jewelry has lived in my life or my family's, each holding those memories. It's wonderful to know it will continue to bear witness to new memories, even if it's not, even if its form has changed. The jewelry in the envelope belonged to my grandmother. It has already seen multiple generations through everyday life, special events, and play. Once again, these pieces can take on a new form and a new story. And so it's kind of just a blessing, right? Like yeah. here, take it and take it and go, you know? To me, that feels like such a satisfying part of the process and about the project. I mean, I, I keep, I think about the project really in terms of circles, like how are circles completed by doing this project? How are communities brought together? How are they catalyzed? How are they made to collaborate? How do people know each other now that didn't know each other before? And what do we know more about each other? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's so, key. that's so key. Uh, what do we know more? How do we partner? How do how can we relate now that we've gone through this process um, that we could not, you know, in a way that we could not relate before, you know, and that's that is really powerful. Uh, could we talk quickly talk about some of the finished products too? Yeah. Um, and um, I know we have a, a some some uh, images of the finished product, and you know the question of where is this jewelry supposed to live, you know, uh, and how do we get it into the hands of people? I want to raise that, that, that issue again. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question and a great, I mean, well, it is the ultimate completion of the circle in this way. Yeah. Like we want the jewelry to go out into the world and tell a story. Um, this is not a piece of jewelry, but it's one of my favorite pieces that has been made. So I had to put it in the slideshow. Um, the, you know, we, our, our goal is to really get this work in the hands of people that'll wear it, that'll treat it well, put it on, on their body and take it out into the world. And, um, you know, hundreds of pieces of jewelry are out in the world being worn but it is our mission that more would go out there, you know? And so at, at the end of each installment, we have an exhibition mm -hmm. and people come, they're always really well attended because there's many donors. And so this ripple of, you know, knowledge and people know about the project and come. Um, so a lot of it does get out in the world, but I'm greedy and it's never <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know how else to say that, you know, like, I just always wish that there was more out in the world. And so I put in a bunch of slides in this uh, slideshow that 
you'll just see, but then some of them, I, I took process shots, like what Andy Cooperman had on his bench and what he made. Um, and what's interesting about this is that it shows this non-hierarchical treatment of material. Like there's 14 karat gold in here, but then there's also uh, low materials that are can't be treated in the same way. So it's interesting to think about how jewelers look at material aesthetically, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the aesthetic value mm -hmm. sometimes that is driving the work, which is interesting to me. That's neat. Yeah. That was a Tiffany heart that was cut in half to use as a ring shank oh. uh, for the ring. So, I mean, so again, talking about innovation and talking about keeping the prior life or aesthetic of the piece, that's also something that I find really interesting in the project. This one, I'll just mention a few things. I have this one right here in front of me because it's one of my favorite ring. Those are macrame beads. So all of you on this Zoom that have ever done macrame, I have a softness in my heart for, for you. Um, this person took the macrame beads, cut them in half. This one, the one that holds the rhinestone was actually further cut and carved out to become the bezel that then holds the rhinestone. So again, thinking about innovation is really exciting. And then the silver is all refined silver that we uh, melted down and rolled out for ingots. And so really great use of material techniques. You know, wow. yeah, so, um, yeah. Interesting. Why don't we, why don't we get into some of these questions? Definitely. Sure. Um, yeah. So there is a question about, is there only gold, silver, et cetera, in your boxes or costume jewelry as well? Oh, well, we take everything. I mean, we take platinum and diamonds all the way down to, as I mentioned before, Mardi Gras beads, which are kind of the lowest of the low um, uh, and very difficult to figure out how to reuse. We've also, it should be stated, we've also never gotten rid of anything. I mean, most of the jewelry manufactured in the costume jewelry industry is destined for the landfill and does make it to the landfill. You know, like at the end of the fashion season, it's generally cut up and thrown away what hasn't been sold. Okay. And so what we do is everything that we get, we keep. We haven't figured out how to responsibly get rid of it. You know, it's not, so we have it all. And we use it for educational purposes. So we send it out to high schools or we have satellite projects. I, there's some images of satellite projects in here as well. Okay. Um, so we had a comment on favorite superpower earlier on about um, that jewelry brings someone into your personal space in an acceptable way. Absolutely. I mean, how many times have you, uh, uh, anyone on this call, like you, you're sticking your nose up in someone's chest and you just met them and you have to <laughs> check out their jewelry. I mean, that's one of the things I, that, uh, yes, it's really true. It invites somehow, right? Mm-hmm. And we had an objection about why no glue? Well, uh, that's actually not a bad question. And it's, uh, um, okay, so glue for one has a, a lifespan, mm -hmm. right? So a traditional jewelry technique that would be maybe equivalent would be tabbing, something that we would grab with metal where you could easily solve that with glue and glue it together. But that piece would have a shorter lifespan than the one that's tabbed because glue breaks down over time. Additionally, the manufacturer of glue, I don't know if it was made in a way that is environmentally hazardous, right? Also resins off gas and, and are um, not that great to work with. And so I don't ban resins, but um, without proper ventilation, they actually cause harm to the person using them. So for all of those reasons, I hope that was satisfying. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you have a huge studio where you store all these repurposed materials or do you only store supplies for just, cur for just current pieces? 
That, that's a uh, good question too. No, I have a really small studio. It's 350 square feet. Um, so I can't really store much in there. I am lucky and work at a university. And so I store the donations now in the metal studio of the school at Virginia Commonwealth University. Yeah, it was all in my basement for a long time, but my husband was like, mm, let's get that out of there. So <laughs> I've recently moved it. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is one question about the transformation of the re wedding ring and how the donor responded. I think you did answer that, but I just want to um, go back to that for just a moment. Yeah, the earrings I responded to that the donor was really happy with the um, ring, the the painful divorce story, we never heard from that man again. Uh, yeah. 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 I guess that's what a gift is, though. You, you don't know, you know, it, we can't have expectations about what happens when we put this world out into the, this work out into the world, right? We can only hope that it goes out into the world and has a good journey. Mm -hmm. so. um, I'll say, I'll do one, one last question here. And it's a curious question. How has the subject of reparations arisen in the work? Hmm. In what uh, way? Yes, and I would, I, I, I'd reach out to Linda Rose to say, oh, um, in what way? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of a curious question. Um, Hi, I, I've tried to unmute. This is Linda. <laughs> Hello, Linda. Hi. Hi. Um, because I'm thinking about the, the source of not just the material, but the hands that, that mine the material, that, that handle the material, that created the jewelry that is then received by someone and then donated mm -hmm. um, and not knowing a lot about the conditions under which gems and other materials are, um, are mined and sourced, it seemed to me that there's probably people being hurt by that process. And I wonder if there's any through line Mm -hmm. back to folks who have been negatively impacted by, mm -hmm. you know, mining diamonds or what, whatever the case may be. So maybe not a real crisp, clear question, but it has me pondering. Yeah, that's, it's, I think it's clear enough. Uh, the way that I can answer that is that, so Radical Jewelry Makeover is the outreach education arm of Ethical Metalsmiths a nonprofit that works to bring transparency, activism and education to the jewelry industry. And so um, we are the education arm and Ethical Metalsmiths is really a source for how jewelers can inform themselves as to what is happening in the industry so that they can make wise decisions when buying material starting now, right? Or starting when they've educated themselves. And so RJM, while RJM cannot or does not at this time deal directly with reparations because we can't necessarily know where the material came from other than this line that I drew in the sand that says it's from this jewelry box, right? Like prior to that jewelry box, I can't really know uh, and so it, it's one of the reasons why I'm ultimately anti-mining, you know, because I, I don't honestly know if we need to reach perpetually into the ground for newly mined material when so much is already above ground. Couldn't we make wiser decisions? So the project is ultimately this this example of how we could make better decisions. We could decide to be different kinds of consumers. We could consciously create circular economies with the things that we buy, the things that we make. And so 
it really is my stand in a way, like, why can't we use what's here? It, in a way, it's why in my independent practice, I also stopped generating. I wanted to see what was here already and respond to it. You know, um, I, unfortunately, I will say, Linda, this is bad news, that um, recycling has done little to stop the need for newly mined material. That's the ultimate dirty truth is that while there's a lot of people that are out in the world saying, I recycle, you know, jewelers, I'm just going to say jewelers, because we know that the problems with recycling uh, across the board, right, like how much we're lied to. So that, that's another story. But um, in the jewelry industry, there's a lot of jewelers that recycle. There's a lot of us that are constantly um, doing the wise thing. Right, like I don't know that we can do uh, the 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 totally right, correct green stamp thing, but the effort to do the the wise thing, but it hasn't changed our need for newly mined material. And in fact, like in the gold industry, only fifty percent of what is mined is actually made into to jewelry. The rest goes into all kinds of other places like bars of gold that then get put in bank vaults or traded on the market or used in electronics or, you know, like our insatiable need to mine um, is really at the heart of your question. Like, how do you know that due diligence has been done all along the supply chain from miner to consumer I will say I have some good news on that, that it, it is a growing trend. There are organizations and uh, mostly uh, nonprofit uh, organizations that are working tirelessly to create chains of due diligence where jewelers will be able to or can at present know exactly where the material was mined and where it came from. So for instance, in 2010, um, Ethical Metalsmiths brought the first fair mined gold to the United States. And so currently Hoover and Strong, and we the account went to Hoover and Strong. It was with Orelsa mine in, in the highlands of Peru. Very little water damage is done in, at this mine site. Proceeds go into building schools, facilities, like it's a cooperative, like we know exactly um, how that money is used, how those people are treated in the environment as well. And so now you can go to Hoover and Strong and order gold directly from this mine. And this is, this is a way, you know, like the idea of farm to table eating, we all understand farm to table, but mine to earring, we don't know this very well. And, but it is a, it is a thing that's happening. And if you're interested, please come to the Ethical Metalsmiths website and check us out or contact me and I can give you resources for that because I think reparations is this question of like, what is fair, right? What is fair? And, and there is, if you go to Ethical Metalsmiths, there is a project we have right now. It's called Better Without Mercury. And it's a, it's a mine site remediation project. It's, an, it's a fundraiser. There's a mine uh, that we're trying to support that wants to, um, they want to create an artisanal fair mined product, but the mine has to be brought up to environmental standards and it costs money, right? So we're trying to say, okay, consumer, if you knew the true cost of something, how would you participate? And so there's there's ways on our website for you to participate that I think uh, open your eyes, but also make you feel good about making wise choices. I, I know that was a long answer. I hope that that was okay for everybody. That was a brilliant answer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Susie Gunch, thank you for joining us. We've come to the end of our, we're gonna end on that, on that statement, on your statement. Thank you cool. for joining us, for raising our consciousness. And also I put the links for um, RJM and for Eth Ethical Metalsmiths into the chat box. So everyone, please check out um, those websites. Uh, thank you so much for presenting your such beautiful work 
and such challenging and conscious raising work. And um, we look forward to seeing more of it. Um, if everyone, I invite everyone to unmute and actually, if we could have a round of applause, that would be lovely. Please feel free to unmute. <laughs> this Good is job. so cool. Thank Great. you so much. I yeah. wish I, yeah, I thank you. It's so nice to see all your faces. Great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Say wonderful. Char, it was so great to see you. <laughs> and you too. <laughs> <laughs> you too. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us.